567, we're going to sing, I'll go where you want me to go, 567.
I want to welcome you tonight to our missions conference this year, and uh, we're excited about the theme that we have, Seven Billion Reasons Why. You heard the choir sing our theme song, and uh, we'll be singing that in just a moment, but I just want to remind you uh, that the population is growing, and uh, we have a great work that God has commissioned us to do, and that's to take the gospel to all seven billion, and uh, what a great work that we have in front of us. Appreciate you being here tonight. Glad that you're here. We're going to start off our service uh, with a uh, special from our uh, Southside Sailors, and so uh, you can be seated, and they're going to sing for us at this time. As they're making their way, let's all stand, turn around and greet somebody with a warm handshake tonight and welcome one another to Southside Baptist Church. And then right after that, Brother Josh is going to lead us in the chorus, Jesus Loves Me. All right, so shake hands and fellowship one with another tonight.
with us. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Appreciate the singing. Weren't the children a blessing tonight? Appreciate them so much. You can be seated. I'm going to ask our missionaries if they would just remain standing. Brother Gardner, you can come on up if you would and uh, open us in prayer. And um, we are glad to have uh, the missionaries that are with us this week. Uh, normally, we have uh, several missionaries. We have three that uh, we have. And uh, usually, we slide in a church planner. But this year, we're emphasizing a little bit more church planting, and the reason is, is uh, you'll figure out one of the missionaries that we are going to be uh, presenting this week, and it's going to be really, uh, really dear and near to our heart. And so I'm going to have our missionaries, if they would, stand real quick, and uh, we'll go across the room and just kind of introduce them real quick. Brother Drinkard, if you'll start with us. Brother Butler? Yes. Uh, Brother Butler, my wife Tana, my kids Tucker and Abigail are in the nursery, and this is our home going to North Tampa. Amen. And uh, Brother Gardner, come and um, uh, we'll have you introduce your family, and then if you would lead us in prayer. I, I'm glad that you're here this, this uh, tonight, and I, I want to encourage you to be here every night. And uh, I just feel like God, uh, my wife and I have been talking about this, just feel like there's been like a momentum for the missions conference. You feel that with me as well? And uh, we're just believing that God is going to do something great this week. I've uh, kind of been using this phrase on purpose instead of a missions conference, more like a missions revival and uh, we can do a lot of things, and we praise the Lord for the good meal and the prep and everybody that participated in that and uh, the children singing and so forth, but we need the Lord to move most of all. And so um, let's ask God to do a special work in our hearts and lives this week, and Brother Gardner, lead us in prayer if you would. Well, uh, good evening. This is my beautiful wife of 12 years, Katie, and this is my daughter, Chloe and Allie. We're the Gardner's missionaries to Peru. Uh, why don't we pray and ask God to bless this evening. Dear God, I ask you, uh, first of all, I thank you for being so good to us, uh, for saving us and for giving us the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, dear God, I ask you that during this week that you would touch our hearts and touch our minds, that we would focus on you and focus on what you are doing around this world. Um, I ask you that you would um, just glorify yourself throughout this week, glorify yourself throughout this service, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Appreciate the uh, choir and their ministry. I know that uh, they not only uh, work uh, to learn music and to sing, uh, to be a blessing to you, but they sing for God's glory, and uh, I know that the Lord's going to use them in a special way. I'm going to have them sing a song tonight. It's entitled, Go Reach the World, and it's a challenge that we all have uh, through the Great Commission uh, to take the gospel into all the world. You listen as they sing. starts with just one voice that takes a stand that makes a choice to live for God and not hesitate to tell the world about amazing grace one day that sees somehow breaks through where there was one there now stands two and soon another takes his hand a ray of 
of hope that spreads across the land. Take your songbooks, 284, 284. Brother Josh is going to come lead us. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me, 284. Let's stand as we sing out this song, 284. Number 284 in your hymn books. Let's stand. Let's all stand and sing. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart. Page 284. together as we sing, Lord, lay some soul upon my heart. That last verse, let's sing it together. It is a joy and privilege uh, this evening that we would have 
the Drinkard family that will be presenting. If they would stand, I'd like to introduce them this evening. They've already introduced themselves, but just again, we have Brother Keith and his wife, um, Melissa, and Kaylin, Keith, Grace, and Lily. Did I get it? Yes. Okay. So they also have these missionary cards. If you get around, grab one of these cards. Uh, Brother Keith, if, if you make your way up here, they're going to give a presentation here in just a minute. Um, get one of these missionary cards. Get to know them. They're sent out of South Norwood Baptist Church in Topeka, Kansas, and they're praying about uh, reaching, I believe it is, Leewood, Leewood, Kansas. And so if you would be in prayer with them about that, and Brother Keith, we will thank you. Well, good evening to you. <laughs> we should probably practice that one again. Uh, good evening. All right, now you convinced me. Thank you so much. Uh, it is a, a pleasure, a blessing to be here, really. Uh, you know, I tell you what, if this was the single uh, missions conference for us here in Florida, we'd come anyways. Uh, we have, uh, or I have, listened to your pastor's preaching for some years now, and I've just really enjoyed uh, his desire for to win the lost soul, and through the power of preaching of God's word. And it's just, um, it's a real privilege and honor for us to be here. Uh, but even more so, uh, we're sent here doing the Lord's work, sent out from our church underneath the authority of South Nolan Baptist Church, and our pastor, Jeremiah Metzinger, who you'll be introduced to in the video shortly. I couldn't do it without the five missionaries that I brought along with me. Again, my wife, Melissa, and Kaylin, Keith, Grace, and Lily. God built and designed them for such a time as this. And we've seen uh, fruit of labor and uh, the reward from your prayers. And so if you continue to pray with us and for um, the Drinkard family and for the families of Leewood, Kansas... Okay, it's a, it's a small, tight-knit community down in the south-central portion of two and a half million um, soul, I guess. Um, you could say it like that. Really, that's what I want to look at it like. I don't want to look at them as just people. I want to look at them how the Lord wants to look at them. Um, grew up in a Baptist church. Uh, smaller than this one is a single aisle Baptist church. And... Uh, just learned faithfulness from my dad. Um, <clears throat> he was a commercial construction worker, so wherever, wherever he went, that was his mission field. That's how he kind of trained us boys. And so there was a point in time in my life where I made a conscious decision uh, to step away from the uh, Lord and from God's word. And God showed his providential grace and his mercy and compassion upon me. And just like the prodigal son, uh, my heavenly father had his arms open. <clears throat> So as, uh, after that seven years of separation, did I make small steps towards him? And over a period of time, God was blessing in my life because he is faithful. And uh, we just wanted to glorify him. Met my wife, and we've been in ministry for just about 15 years, uh, serving inside of our local church. Uh, we were serving and ministering to teenagers and then to college and career age, and then soon my parents' age, which is really weird to think about. The people before me, as I was teaching the Bible, had seen me in the nursery and you know what happens in the nursery, you know, so that was kind of a different, <laughs> different uh, complex there. But with that being said, is that as we were ministering and being faithful in church and being faithful in the workplace, God was expanding both platforms. As we were serving the community, um, we saw that God was blessing that and people being reached in portions and areas which not a lot of people could be. After I graduated Kansas State University, which don't hold that against me, uh, I went into banking. And I went into banking, and I was growing in, in the career, climbing the corporate ladder, uh, not, not to seek the pleasures from doing so or putting that as number one, but just trying to be faithful and serving the Lord there. And uh, he was allowing me to, to speak with people and share the gospel that maybe our pastor couldn't or that another individual in their workplace could not. And so uh, we were a missionary in that field, and there was really at one point over the last three years, I've been training to, to take uh, the final position, if you will, in, in our regional market as a president for the bank. Did the Lord provide an opportunity for us to, to step out on faith and to go the direction of church planting? So in 2014, did uh, God lay upon our hearts to share it publicly what he had been doing in our hearts for years? And that is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ as he... Uh, spoke to me out of Ezekiel 3 and Matthew 28 and Mark 16 did uh, we see um, hindsight 2020 and what the Lord was doing in our lives after sharing that with our pastor uh, we've been uh, faithful in serving in our churches in all capacities for the last eight years with director of hospitality to being an usher to teaching Sunday school to being a deacon and so on and so forth but four specific years in his office every Tuesday training 
and preparing. We did take a church as an extension of our ministry in the Kansas City area and to breathe life, I guess, to, to see God breathe life into that church was pretty powerful. The pastor passed away in his study suddenly uh, and left a struggling, dying church. But to see what God was doing with it, it was utterly amazing. Again, it was nothing that I could do. It was all the Lord doing it through us. And then um, through a couple of decisions that was made, we were called away from that, which was fine. We wanted to see the church prosper. Uh, through a series of bad decisions that the leadership made, they, uh, the doors ended up closing. And I don't believe that that is uh, the pastor's or God's word. I don't believe that's his plan. So I would like for you to enjoy the video. But one last thing I'd like to, to share with you is this, is to our, uh, our motto, if you will, if you can say it like that, is to lift him up and to preach his name and to invite souls to love him and to follow him which is the highest, heavenliest privilege of human life. W.A. Criswell read that. Jesus Christ said, and, and I, if I be lifted up from earth, will draw all men unto me. And that's exactly what the Drinkard family wants to do in Kansas City, is lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you. It's a little bit more surreal as we're sitting here having this conversation you're watching the people kind of walk to and from and you know you don't necessarily understand their uh, their lives intimately but you have a greater idea of what the bible says about the world and the need of the spreading of the gospel of jesus christ obviously any in all cities uh, are in need of the gospel uh, but there was one uh, vision specifically that was on the heart of our pastor and that had grown on ours. And as the vision grew, Leewood, Kansas, uh, the idea was born from that. Leewood, Kansas has been on my heart for about 12 years. It was right after missions conference one evening. Uh, he asked me to step aside and pray with him. And he gave me his altar card from that evening. And on the altar card, he said, you know, I've surrendered to the ministry. And so there in the next couple of weeks, we began to pray. And I shared with him my burden for Leewood. And it was almost as if the two visions were paired together. And we, we just knew that the Lord would have us at this time to plant a church in the heart of Leewood, Kansas. This is very uh, corporate centric and entertainment comfort pleasure focused city. Uh, within 35,000 there's three country clubs. If we were to look throughout the city you would notice uh, the retail shops and boutique stores and you would notice also to the uh, presence of large corporations that not only have a presence here but are headquartered in the city. Uh, headquartered is a movie theater chain here in town. Behind me is uh, the Sprint World Headquarters and these corporations like Black and & Beach and, and other corporations bring in employees from all over the world and we have an opportunity to reach them with the gospel. The idea of an enhanced lifestyle through the world's riches is here in the city. And so what we're here to do is impart the gospel to them and give them something that they could really invest into. Uh, instead of investing in things that are going to corrupt, uh, the things that are going to have no eternal value, uh, we understand that the one thing that will live forever is not their riches, but is their soul. Our hope is not just to send the drinkards out. Our hope is to walk alongside of him and his family. And so when a church gets behind the drinkard family, they're really, they're joining in with South Knollwood and we become a team to help move that family into Leewood and plant a church. That's the vision, that's what we're going after. And we believe now is the time and we believe the drinkards are the ones that can get us all the way there. These individuals know and understand business day in and day out. They also know what, what it takes to have a return on their investment. But there is a, an inheritance that is not tangible here on earth that they can have. And I think that if they knew the riches that's available to them through Jesus Christ, not only would they be more apt to listen, but they'd be more apt to change their focus less on the, on the riches of this life. And, more on the inheritance and the riches that Jesus Christ brings.
through his, uh, his calling in our lives, uh, coupled with the vision of our pastor, uh, the influence of the Holy Spirit leading us to a place like this. Uh, we know there's a need in Leewood, just like there's a need anywhere else, but we feel as though the Lord has called us to this place to do His work. I appreciate the vision and the heart of the Drinkard family, amen. And um, I'm reminded, you know, many times we, we see a poor area and we think they need the gospel. And I'm just going to, I don't have to tell you this, but our churches are no longer going to inner cities and they're also leaving areas of affluence as well. And uh, these places need churches as well, amen. They really do. And so I just uh, uh, love hearing the testimony, see how God connects the dots and aren't you thankful that God called Peter and John, who were fishermen, and he, always, he also calls bankers? Amen. He used people from all walks of life and all, about, all backgrounds to accomplish his work, and so we praise the Lord for that. I'm going to have um, Brother Josh come lead us. We're going to sing our theme chorus. I really appreciate this, this chorus and hope you'll just kind of capture it. I hope it'll stay with you all night, all day as you're going throughout. Seven billion reasons why. Let's stand. Let's sing out this chorus. Ushers, if you'll come. We'll sing it twice, and then ushers come, and we'll receive our offering tonight. All right, let's sing it out on seven billion reasons why. <laughs> seven billion reasons why. faithfulness, Lord. We thank you, Father, that we can have a part in your work here and around the world, Lord. We ask your blessing upon the offering. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Mr. Debbie, appreciate that so much. I uh, want to just make a couple of announcements real quick. Justice, would you mind bringing me your book real quick? And um, just you can stand right there, Justice. I just want to show this. Teenagers, if you haven't gotten your, uh, your uh, conference um, workbook, make sure you see the Crumptons right after. Pick this up and uh, make sure you fill it out. I know there's places for notes and different things like that as well. And then um, uh, with all the Southside sailors, if you haven't gotten your missions passport booklet, uh, the Sards, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Sard will be right down front afterwards and they'll have these. So make sure you pick up your um, passport for the missions conference. You wanna fill that out and bombard our missionaries every night. So uh, get all the information and they love it when you bombard them, don't you missionaries? They're excited about that. So make sure you get that, that, uh, um, that booklet. It's a joy to have with us uh, our uh, conference speaker this week, Brother Terry McGovern. And uh, Miss Marianne, would you mind standing? And um, uh, we appreciate them so much. M Brother McGovern is no stranger. Y'all can be seated, but there are no strangers here. Uh, the McGoverns were actually our very first missionaries and uh, when we started the church back in 03, uh, Brother Terry and Marianne were getting ready with their kids to go to New Guinea. And uh, so being from Alaska, they decided to get acclimated to the weather. And so they uh, stayed in uh, some homes over in Clearwater, just waiting on their visas. And so, uh, uh, so when we started the church, they started coming here. And what a blessing they were. God had already knitted our heart. And uh, I'll never forget, um, uh, one morning, uh, we had our Ford van, and we crammed everybody in a, that van, and how many, how many army duffel bags did y'all load up? I think it was like 15 army duffel bags, and so it was like a four o'clock drop off in the morning. We took them to Tampa International, dropped them off with all these little kids and all these army duffel bags, and they flew uh, to Papua New Guinea. And Amy and I got in a car and cried. <laughs> and uh, they got on a plane and wept. And, um, but God had called them there. And boy, what a great work they've done. And we've had some of our folks go over and uh, see the ministry over there. And uh, 12 years that they had. And uh, God used them in a mighty way. Now they're in Alaska uh, at uh, their church there. And uh, we praise the Lord for what he's doing there. Brother... Uh, Terry and uh, Marianne, we, we uh, count them dear friends, and uh, I, I really mean that, dear friends, and uh, I love them, and God's knitted our heart through the years. I'm glad that he's here. Um, he is a good Bible preacher, um, and not only is he a good Bible preacher and expositor of the word, but he has a walk with God. And uh, I thank God. I believe, I know God's hand is on him. I know that when he preached tonight that you'll sense the moving of the Lord. I want to encourage you to get your Bible. Listen, pay attention, listen from your heart. There will be many distractions in your life that Satan has already planted to defeat the purpose of this message in our hearts. Amen. You know, I, oft, I believe this. I believe as much as God works on a message and, and he, he prepares the heart, prepares a sermon, I believe Satan is also working, and he is trying to counter everything that God does. And so uh, he, he will try to thwart, distract, uh, get you off on a thought. And so I, I challenge you on purpose to just tune in to the Lord and allow, uh, humble yourself before the Word of God and just allow God to move in your heart and, uh, and let that be a blessing. Right before Brother uh, McGovern comes and preach, uh, Sarah is going to sing for us. And uh, Sarah, you sing to us, right? He stood before the crowd that day to tell of what he'd seen. The smoke of a thousand villages where the gospel had not been. Is there someone here who's willing now to leave and go abroad? Then one man went from the crowd 
that day to reach a continent for God. He made a difference in a land across the sea. He made a difference in a place on bended knee, a thousand villages where he brought hope from despair. He made a difference in this world. He stood before the church that day to tell of what he'd see. The smoke of a thousand cities where the gospel had not been. Is there someone here who's willing now to listen to God's call? Will you be that one to lead the way and reach America for God? Go make a difference in this land you're living in, a nation filled with souls. Lost and in their sin, a thousand cities in view that are waiting for you. Go make a difference in this world. I'll make a difference in this land I'm living in. Lord, I'm willing to go where the gospel has not been on the horizon I see calling to me I'll make a difference in this world on the horizon I see people calling to me I'll make a difference in this world Amen. Certainly appreciate that. Boy, certainly appreciate the privilege of being able to come here and preach this year's Missions Conference for Southside. It's so good to see so many of you again here. Again, this was always a second home church for us. It was, it was, like, it was, our, it was like we had two sending churches, our church in Alaska and then Southside Baptist Church as well. And we had spent so much time here, really on our furloughs. Uh, we spent more time at Southside than at any other church uh, um, during that time. We'd base out of here because of the missionary homes and, of course, we had the relationship with uh, Brother Kerry and Sister Amy, and we, we, we greatly appreciate their friendship over the years. So it's such a privilege to be here right now. I really hope this is a blessing and help to the church in regards to the Missions Conference. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Start reading there in verse 16. And I still remember that morning well, my brother Kerry, wherever he went down, I don't see where he's at right now, there he is, when you dropped us off at the airport, when me and Marianne talked about that when we flew in, we had went by the area where we got dropped off, and we brought that up, remembering coming through there with all those bags, and we were greatly, we were already in culture shock, we weren't even there yet when we were trying to move there to New Guinea, and I still remember our arrival there in country, and we didn't, you know, we didn't know anybody, all those bags, little, finally the last plane, little tiny plane, didn't have enough seats for us, they just put us on laps of each other is how they did that. They left half our bags literally on the tarmac because it didn't have enough room for all of our bags, and they flew us over there, little dirt runway, plane took off, and, and uh, we were nothing but scared to death is all we were, and uh, all of a sudden literally, literally sitting on an island in the jungle and trying to figure out what, where to go from there. And so it was, it was an amazing experience during that time. We thank the Lord very much for it. We still maintain much contact. We'll be going back to New Guinea in January. We went, I was there two times last year and still following up with our works there. We have two primary works there, the work in Soho and the church there, and the work in the village of Kudu Kudu. But uh, yeah, so we're, we're looking forward to heading back there, me and Mary and both this time in January. All right, but Acts chapter 17, let's start there in verse 16 to start off this missions conference and go down through the end of the chapter. It says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. 
Then certain philosophers at the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, Wilt this babbler say? What will this babbler say? Others, uh, some, he seemed to be a, a, a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine wherefore thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. Uh, we would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For I pass by, and behold, your devotions. I found an altar to the inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein seen, that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needeth anything seen, he giveth to all life and breath and all things." And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily uh, they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, and certain also of your own poets have said, for we are all also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone or graven uh, by art of man's device. He said, And at times of this ignorance God winked it, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Wherefore he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. When they heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Others said, we will, hear, we will hear thee again of this matter. So, do, so Paul departed from among them. And this is the first part of verse 34. Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I love you. Lord, I pray for your blessing upon the message tonight. I pray that you would work. Lord, I, I pray that I would not be hindrance to this. I pray that your spirit would have free course to do the work that it needs to do. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit, that you would move tonight and challenge us and draw us closer to you through your word. And Lord, I pray and beg you for your blessing upon the conference. Lord, that we'd be obedient to what you would have us to do. As no doubt many here are praying what you'd have them to do for this next year in regards to missions. I pray your blessing would be upon it. Please, Lord, work. Again, Father, I love you and I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Again, I do hope you're praying what the Lord would have you to do as this is a faith promise missions conference. I hope you're already seeking God and begging, please, God, show me what you would have. Lay upon my heart. Maybe he'll use it through the preaching. Maybe he's, maybe he's already been guiding you. But what I'd just ask is that you'd be surrendered to the Lord exactly what he would have you to do. I do believe I've heard it said many times from all the years in ministry and, 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 and from my teenage years that the missions conference is the single big, biggest business meeting of the year for the church. And that's true. If you want God, what we need more than anything else in our life and in our church is God's favor. And if you decide you're going to miss missions, you are going to miss God's favor in your life. And so tonight what I want to do is I, I want to look at this. So I want to see where Paul, and to be true of us as well, is stirred into action in regards to missions. If this conference is going to be successful, you have to be stirred into action. We have a great example here of, of, of missions taking place with the Apostle Paul. I want to take you to this city here that is, that is this pagan culture and see missions at work. See, we're coming to a time and a place as things are changing rapidly in our nation and in the world, culturally speaking, that it even seems within independent fundamental Baptist circles, we're, we're, we're losing sight of what really works when it comes to missions. And yet we see it so plainly laid out in the Word of God, the challenge and the teaching, it's all clear. So I hope tonight as we start this, as we get, we get a glimpse of some keys to missions, an example of missions at work right here in the city of Athens. So we're going to take a look at Paul in action in a pagan, Christless culture and how it worked. So we need to understand a little, a little bit about Athens during the day of Paul. Let's see what Paul was facing when he arrived there. For one, Paul had just been run out of two towns, Thessalonica and then Berea. When he, when he got thrown out of Berea, he had, a, he, had a, he had to get out of there very quickly, rapidly, is usually the case. And so they made arrangements when he left. He was going to head down, to head down to Athens, and then Paul and Silas would come there and meet him, and then they'd head down to Corinth. 
The plan was to get to Corinth, but they had a delay because of getting thrown out of uh, getting thrown out of, uh, out of uh, Berea. So he's waiting for him in Athens. He's by himself when we pick this up, just waiting on Timothy and Silas to come. And so Paul comes to the city of Athens. It's a great city. The city is no longer the political power that it once was by this time. It's no longer the econ economic power either, but it is still the university city of the world. It was the home to the greatest philosophers of the day, men like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. There are great temples throughout it, like the temple to Zeus. There's theaters, there's marketplaces. It was called the Eye of Greece and the Mother of Art and Eloquence. It was said that there was 30,000 gods at this time in the city of Athens. Many of these had statutes. Many, actually, many of these things still survive to this day. You can actually travel there and see some of them even today. Paul recognized that these were not merely objects of art, but they were actually gods that were being worshipped by the people in Athens. He's walking, understand what Paul's doing. He comes to Athens, probably a place he's wanted to visit. The world heard of Athens at this time. It was a major world city. And he's walking around and he sees 30,000 different idols, false gods that our people are worshiping. Again, I can just imagine him in my mind walking around and seeing all the idolatry taking place. It was a city that was also going to be consumed with the sensual. Because at this time, what went hand in hand in this part of the world was idolatry and the sensual. They went together. Much like our culture, sensuality it was a driving factor in Athens. There would be prostitution, there would be parties, all associated in the name of religion for that matter. As far as the demographics of Athens at this time, it was made up of three different groups of people. We're introduced to them in our text. You had the common man who would be given over to the idolatry. Um, the sensuality would dominate them, the idolatry would control their life. They would have different jobs that they would work and whatnot, but it was all about the idolatry and the sensuality that went with it. There was another group called the Epicureans. These were the philosophers of their day. They were not idolaters. They were atheists. They did not believe in any god and would mock those who did. They were the intellectuals of their day. They believed when a man died, that was it. They denied a life after death. They were also very materialistic. Since they believed that this life was it, they believed you lived, you get the most out of it, and that's it. You know, they would have the bumper sticker on their car, he who dies with the most toys wins. Therefore, their life really also became much about pleasure. They even looked at it as a virtue. Pleasure would be a virtue. And that pain would be the opposite. You did whatever you could to avoid, avoid pain in their philosophy, but you lived for pleasure. It was their motto, we still hear it often today, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. They were what we would call today ex existentialists. They, they lived for the moment and for now, living for the experience of that moment. Again, it's still a popular philosophy of our day today. We had also another group were introduced that was part of Athens, and that is the Stoics. They were very pantheistic. They believed God was in all and, and did not exist simply as one entity. They believed God was in the rocks, he was in the trees, he was in the mountains, anything material. Pantheism do uh, dominated. We see that today in our world. That, that Eastern philosophy of pantheism has crept into America. We have to be careful. You can see in different ways it's even creeping into our churches. <clears throat> they prided themselves, the Stoics, that I'm being level-headed and they could take whatever comes at them. They were also very fatalistic with their view of life. So Paul is going to be brought before all three of these groups at one time. The Epicureans, the Stoics, and the common man. He's brought to Mars Hill, which was a true hill. Um, uh, um, however, the, you know, the, there's, there's, there's a lot of meaning of that, which goes much deeper. I won't get into much of it. But Mars Hills was the Aragopas, the Greek word. Uh, that is the Greek word that means Mars Hill. It was the name given to a court of judges who had the final authority in the city of Athens at this time. And so Paul is brought before this court of judges who had authority in Athens. And this is who he's going to be speaking before as well as the common man would be present. But Paul is walking around. He sees a major town, a major city, wholly given over to idolatry. 30,000 gods, idols everywhere. 
people praying to them. He's watching as people are praying to those different gods. I would I, imagine several in here have traveled in the east and you've seen the idolatry taking place with people praying and praying for hours upon hours to some object made of man's hands. This was a place that needed a missionary. This was a place that needed truth. And Paul recognized that. So when he gets stirred, I'm going to cover that as my first point here in just a second. He moves into action, which will be my second point. But he's brought first, as is, was his pattern, to the Jewish synagogue where he would preach. And it's why he's there that some of the Epicureans and Stoics hear him, and they bring him before that council of judges. They heard something new to them. They are always grabbing for something new anyhow, but they heard his words, and it was still something different even to them. And so they brought him before the court of judges for other men here. Paul had been preaching in the markets at this time uh, uh, to the Jews in the synagogue. And so now they bring him before this great audience. They want to hear what he has to say. And so we see Paul's approach to missions. A man who was right to God, a man who he considered the greatest missionary who ever lived. I think we'd be foolish to try and improve on his methods. So this is the setting. Let's go to verse 16 of our text. It says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. The key was as Paul was walking around, his spirit gets stirred at what he's witnessing at. It moves him. He, he just can't believe what he is witnessing right now. The word means here to be provoked. It means it greatly bothered him what he was seeing. It was provoking in his heart. He wasn't just looking around at, at the art and the amazement. You know, you can see that today as people would go around, uh, around Athens, maybe even Christians, and they say, wow, look at this statue, look at the artwork, look what they did to this. Paul could care less about that. He wasn't admiring the different uh, 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 beauties of Athens. He knew all that one day, down, all that would burn. I could even see that when people come on, whether it's even to Alaska or, or, or over to New Guinea, might be more fitting for this setting, when they would come on mission trips, you, you could almost tell those who were stirred for the people or stirred for the environment that they were in. Paul was not stirred simply by the greatness of the city. It was what he witnessed was taking place in the lives of the people who were living apart from truth. When he saw the wickedness, he saw the need. Too often today we have our, our churches are not stirred or provoked by the culture, but we determine to almost imitate the culture instead of being provoked by what we're seeing. But we need our spirit stirred at the culture. And really, and this conference is going to be successful. It's your spirit that has to be stirred. As you hear the missionaries and as you even, even as you leave here and you, and you head out of Tampa and you see the people all around you, to have your spirit stirred towards it. Paul was looking through the city through spiritual eyes and saw the true spiritual condition. Listen, this isn't going to take place unless your walk is right with God. See, this is something where God's Spirit moves in your heart. As Paul's going through Athens, you better believe it's God's Holy Spirit indwelling in him that's moving him to see what's taking place as the Lord sees the idolatry there and he's commanded all men everywhere to repent. Again, he didn't care about all the greatness of the city and the statues and the art. He knew all that one day that would all burn. It was all vanity. That's all it was. It was vanity. He cared about the souls of the people who would be separated from God in hell. And it stirred him into action. He saw all the glamour, the idolatry. He knew it was keeping the people blinded from the true God. He was burdened by what he saw. Too often what stirs, what provokes us, is bad drivers, long lines, and long church services. That's what tends to stir our spirit to provoke us. I won't be long, don't worry. Again, it is the fact that Paul's spirit was stirred that moved him into action. If you're actually going to take action, 
be obedient, whether that, that is going to a foreign mission field, whether that's being faithful to soul winning each week, or that's being faithful to witness to your co-workers and be the light that needs to be around them, or what you're going to do towards missions this year. Your spirit has to be stirred towards the right things. And that takes spiritual vision from God. That takes you being close to God. One of the most important things of this week, it, along with the preaching, is your own devotion time each morning. Too often it's the wrong thing that stirs our spirit today, that provokes us. Now notice the wording as we head into the second point here. It says, now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. He witnessed the idolatry. Now look how verse 17 starts. That's referring back to him being stirred, therefore. Because he was stirred, he's going to do something. If what you see when you leave these doors doesn't stir you, you're not going to do much. When you see the presentations, if it doesn't stir you, you're not going to do much. It says, therefore, disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with him that met with him. Then, of course, also the Epicureans and the Stoics get involved as he's preaching at the markets. They begin to hear him. So what Paul did because he was stirred, he began to look for opportunities now. He saw the need that was present, and he was not going to waste any opportunity he had. No doubt he already knew of the synagogue that was there, and he went there. He knew there he would have an audience he could begin to preach with. And then from there, he'd break out into the markets to do some open-air preaching. He looked for opportunities. You're not going to look for any opportunities unless your heart is stirred. So he goes to the synagogue and begins to preach Christ. He started with a group that had a basis of God, that were monotheistic, that that understood of the Creator, that was waiting for a Messiah, and Paul starts with them to begin to proclaim that truth. Again, they were not idolaters, but they certainly needed to hear the gospel as much as anybody else in the city did. They would go to the same hell apart from Christ. Again, when he saw the need, he was stirred, so he looked for opportunity. Again, make no mistake about it. Right now, this week is an opportunity for you at this missions conference. You look for the opportunities that God has given you, whether it is a coworker, whether it is a neighbor, whether it is a family member or passing out tracks. When your heart gets stirred, you'll begin to notice those opportunities more and more and more. Where people will put the Lord right before you. Whether it's somebody, somebody just, I've had... I, I, I've seen people just a casual uh, acquaintance. I remember I was in South, just got back on a, on a furlough in South Florida. I was down in Fort Myers. And I was, I was uh, working on my laptop and it went out. It broke. And so I ran it to a Best Buy real quick to get it fixed and figured they could fix it. So I took it there. I dropped it off at Best Buy. And as I was heading out right next door to Best Buy was a Books A Million. And I love bookstores. And so I said, oh, man, I haven't been out in bookstores in, in three or four years, more than four years at that point. And so I went in Books A Million. And I headed in there, and I was over, over in the religious section, the theology section of the bookstore. And there's another one other person in there. He, he was in a work uniform, and he was looking around at different Bibles and stuff. And really, I wasn't paying any attention to him, and he called over to me. He had said, he called me up and asked if I could help him for a second. I said, sure. He said, he said I just went to the church for the first time in a long time on Sunday. And he said, the pastor told me to look for something called an ESV Bible. He said, could you help me with that? And I said, well, I said, I, I, I could. And, and I happened to know that he looked incredibly burdened. You could just see such a look of, of concern upon his face. And so I asked him, I, I brought it up, I said, I said, to be honest, it looks like something's wrong. I said, I said I'm, a, I'm actually a preacher, I'm a missionary. And I said, would you like to sit down and talk? And they had a coffee shop there. And in this big, he's a big guy. He said, yes, I would. And so he we went and sat down and talked. And he opened right up. He doesn't know me from anybody. He opened right up. He said, I messed up with my wife really bad. She just left me. Last week, she took off. And he said, that's why I went to church on Sunday. And he's crying. And so I head into the gospel with him, go right into the gospel with him. By the end, he's still just crying. And I finished the presentation. I didn't even have to ask him if he wanted to put his faith in Christ. Completely on his own, he prayed out loud right there. Lord, please save me. I believe you died for me. And so both of us, both of us are in tears by this point. And, uh, and then I directed him to a King James version of the Bible before he left. And I explained to him that how amazing the situation is that my laptop had to happen to go out, happened to see the bookstore. 
Listen, the Lord will put opportunities before you all the time. All the time. But I assure you, you will never, ever look for those opportunities until your spirit is stirred towards the things of God. It won't take place. Thirdly, we see he had the Lord's providence when Paul responded in faith. You see the Lord now work. The Lord now intervenes in the life of Paul because of his obedience and his faith. Because his spirit was stirred, he's taking advantage of the opportunities that is given to him. But then the Lord providentially intervenes in his life. He says, I'm going to take you before the court of judges of one of the greatest cities in the world. And they are going to hear this truth. Incredible. And you'll find God's providence over and over in your life where he maneuvers and he works to control situations that you never thought you'd ever be in. Paul never thought when he went to Athens. It was just a meeting place. That's all it was. He could have just said, I'm waiting for Corinth. I'm waiting for Corinth. But he's sitting in Athens. And his spirit was stirred towards the idolatry. He was faithful. The opportunities were there. He heads to a synagogue. He heads to a market. And now God intervenes. God's providential hand will always be on you when you're faithful and obedient to him. He's brought before a great multitude, before the high court of the city, to preach Christ. And then we get into a point I really want us to see today, because this is where I think we're really really beginning to miss it. I, I noticed it greatly upon returning to the States three years ago. There was a definite change. We, we have a, a large glimpse of what Paul preached to them at Athens. Think of the common man that's there that are wholly given over to idolatry. The Epicureans living for pleasure as well, atheistic. The Stoics believing God is in everything. Incredible. What he does, he goes and he preaches the gospel. He doesn't hold back. He doesn't modify his message at all. See, he knew, he, he, the Lord used him to pen Look over in Romans chapter 1. This is what Paul knew. The Lord used him to pin these words in. Look at Romans chapter 1 with me real quick. One verse here. I want you to see this. It's a verse that probably most of us in here could quote, but I just want you to see it in the Word of God. Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now get this. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. That is still true. It is the truth of the gospel that is key. That is it. Nothing else. The key to seeing genuine conversion take place in the life of any individual is the truth of the gospel. That's where he knew the power lied. He knew the power was not in relationship building. That's not where it was. I'm not against relationship building, but that's not where the power lies. The key to you being effective is going to be the preaching of the gospel and being effective with it. I think the devil's been attacking us for generations right now, or I should say decades right now, over over either trying to get us to become more like the culture or downplaying and, and, and watering down the gospel. It's saying effective with the truth. In our our day, it's been the idea of relationship building that is leading churches to change, become seeker-sensitive churches. They're changing their music so the culture can relate. They're changing their standards so as to make them feel more comfortable when they come into church. Please understand this. This is so true, and we're losing it today. We do not make the church like the world to win the world. The fact is the culture within God's assembly of people, his local church, should be very different than the world. Listen, if they're not won by the gospel, then they're not one to Christ. They're simply one to your church. Again, the key is not being cool. The key is not being the new pastor in Anchorage and getting a nice tattoo over here and and, and changing so that, you know, my suit isn't threatening when they come in. Remember, I had a conversation, and this was was with a church member, and I was just shocked. She was saved, no, no question about that. Very much in the fashion. 
Very, and I don't necessarily have a problem with that. Don't, you know, I'm, I'm fine. My, my wife dressed nice, nice and everything. But she was very much into fashion. She told me how she did not want to dress Amish so that when she witnessed, people would listen to her. And I thought, hmm, that's an interesting statement. First, I'd never known this person ever to witness to anybody in my life. I never saw her go out one time soul winning. I, I, never witnessed, I never saw her tell anybody the gospel. But I'm thinking to myself, she thinks the reason why the Amish aren't affected with the gospel is because of the way they dress. The reason why the Amish are not affected with the gospel is because they don't have the gospel. If they had the gospel, even dressing the way they do, and they preach truth, it would be effective. It would be effective. Now, make no mistake about it, Paul knew his audience. He knew the groups of people that were present when he was preaching. He wasn't ignorant to that fact. You see, the, the motto of our day, that verse is taken well out of context. What is it? 1 Corinthians, I believe, 9.22, that Paul became like all men, that, that by all means he might save some. I can't quote it. I'm going to mess it all up right now. I should be able to quote that. Uh, but listen, that verse, that verse dealt, it did not at all deal with Paul becoming like a pagan to win a pagan. That's not what, it dealt with him using his, when you actually study chapter 9 out, he actually, that was dealing with him becoming a servant in that culture he was in to win them to Christ uh, um, and not using his liberty in Christ or, or, or offending the group. He, he wouldn't do that as far as any liberty he had, not, not dealing with the truth of the gospel. Interesting. Maybe another time I'll be here, we'll preach on that chapter. So Paul knew his audience, and he even pulled from the culture. He referred to their poets, and also, of course, preaching to the, the marker there of the unknown God. I imagine most of you might know the story of that. That would be the creator, and Paul would know the story of the unknown God. There would have been common one of the day. I don't remember if I can get all the details of it right. It had been years ago since I, since I had read about that. But the unknown God, something that happened about, I believe it was... It was maybe as much as 100 years prior to this event on, on Mars Hill that had taken place. They had a, a plague or something running through. People were dying left and right, and they were praying to all the gods. They had nothing was changing it. And so the leaders, like this council, met, and they said, the problem is there must be a god that we don't know about. And they said, we need to find out about that god and pray to him. So they sent for, it was, it was a philosopher, it wasn't a monotheistic person at all, but they sent for a, somebody they thought could help them to advise them. So this advisor comes in and they said, this is our problem, we got this major sickness, we've been praying to all our gods, nothing's changing it. And he agreed, there's a God you don't know. He said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're, we're going to get a bunch of sheep of all animals, they pick a sheep, believe it or not, and they cause them to fast. They cage them up, they're going to, they're going to cause them to fast, they're going to take them out to Mars Hill, and they're going to release them. And what they want to know is, and, what they're, and they're praying during, during this time to this unknown God, that if you're there, what they want is for, for these sheep that should be incredibly hungry just to go out in this grassy hill and just lay down and not eat. They're putting a the fleece out, if you will, if there's a God they don't know about. So that's exactly what they did. They allow that to take place. They release him. The sheep go up on the hill, and they just lay down. And they realized there's a God we don't know about. And so they began to pray to that God to stop what, whatever sickness was coming through, and it worked. They put the marker up to the unknown God. So Paul is now saying, I'm here to tell you about that unknown God. So he would use things from the culture, but he never became the culture. There's a huge difference. It's not about making the church into an entertainment base for the people. God should always be the center of what this is about. When he preached, if you know, it, that is a, if you think about who he's speaking to and you go through his sermon, wow. As I said earlier, he doesn't hold back. He went immediately, like you do with the gospel, right at the sin of the culture. Christ did the same thing. How about the woman at the well? Oh, give me this water that I may drink. You know what most of us would do? The way we were taught soul winning? Let's pray. She was ready. I want, I want this water. But Christ said, you know, no, 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 not, not yet. Why don't you go get your husband first? Let's, let's deal with this first. Let's deal with sin first. How about the rich man? I want eternal life. Let's pray. <laughs> Great. Man, so glad to hear it. And Christ quotes to that man the commandments over and over. Convicting. And this guy's still not getting a clue yet. 
I've kept all these for my youth up, which he hasn't. It's a complete lie. He says, oh, really? Okay. All right. Let me make it clear for you. Go and sell everything you have and follow me. Oh, that's a problem. He was dealing with sin first. Do you know what Paul does here? He deals with the sin first. And Paul wasn't general with it either. Just like Christ wasn't with the woman at the well. Just like Christ wasn't with the rich man. And he went right, he said, I can't believe what you're doing here. You're actually worshiping things made with men's hands. And, and he goes after the idea of a creator's created all of us, that there's only one God. That's all there is. And he's preaching Christ. He stayed with truth. He pointed out the sin in the culture. He didn't dance around it. He understood this would not be popular. But it was truth, and he knew the only way that's going to lead to genuine conversion is staying with truth. We have, we're having a missions emphasis every Sunday night this week in, in my church I pastor in Alaska, the Independent Baptist Church of Anchorage. And so on this past Sunday night, we had one of our men we're going to be sending out this January to help out fill in some of the villages in Alaska for missionaries that are trying to go back on a furlough. So he's going to step in and fill in. And he made a great, great statement during his message on Sunday night when he preached for me. He said, he said, the reality is, he said, we don't send missionaries, we send truth. That's exactly right. It's sending truth. <clears throat> Again, he pointed out the sin in the culture. He was preaching what the culture needed to hear. Because Paul was genuinely stirred and cared for them. We also see in verse 30, he recognized that, that the idolatry would need to change, the atheistic attitude would need to change, and, and he demanded repentance. Repentance is turning from whatever you're trusting in simply to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's recognizing the direction that your sin is taking you. It's saying it's not mixing the gospel with anything else. But in verse 30, he said this, At times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Paul had the same response from two different cultures, really, the Jewish culture and this pagan culture. Some believed, and a lot didn't. That was the truth. That's what happened. In other words, whether it was the Jewish culture, which was monotheistic, or the all the pantheism that was there, the idolatry that was there, the, 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 the atheism that was there, there were some that believed, but many who did not. Paul understood it was his responsibility not to fill a pew, but to fill the pulpit with truth. That's what he did. That's what he did. And so again, tonight... As we think of missions in this missions conference, we need to take notice of what Paul did. What was key to it? He was in an environment, but he didn't plan on this trip. But due to other circumstances, the Lord's in control of all of it. And make no mistake, where you're at in life, the Lord knows right where you're at in life. There's no surprises in your life where God says, wow, I, I didn't expect that. And it's us having that close walk with God where we can have our spirit stirred. It's from there we'll take advantage of the opportunities that God has given us. Just like right now this week, you have an opportunity with the missions conference of what you're going to do this next year towards world missions. There's seven billion reasons why you should be praying every day about this conference. I don't know about you, but if I was one of those pagans worshiping an idol, man, I would love for somebody to come with truth. to be effective with it, to present it in a manner that I would understand. Paul did not water down the message to make it more palatable to his audience. He recognized his audience and he addressed their need in relation to the gospel. He did not set up a philosophy cub in order to build those bridges first. He didn't establish the Athean Angel CCM rock band so he can get the youth of Athens. 
He did not use marketing methods. He didn't focus on music. He preached the gospel. You know what that led to? Conversions. Genuine conversions. See, when Paul wrote a prayer letter back, he did not say how he had 4,272 saved this month and three are now coming to church. Quiet on that. I don't understand that. It's being effective with the gospel. Truth. He focused on the gospel. And it is true. You see, we have to understand. I think that's where we're getting to it. As America has changed, as America has changed, become more secular, more humanistic, at the same ratio, the gospel becomes more offensive to the culture. The gospel is not nearly as offensive to our culture what it was in 1890 as it is right now. But please understand, we'll, if we're going to stay with the gospel, there's nothing we can do about the offense of the gospel. But we're having trouble adjusting to that because we were used to a nation where the gospel wasn't offensive. That's no longer true. We don't change our message to lessen the offense. We preach truth. You know what's going to happen? Some will believe and many will reject. But know what you have, Brother Nance? You'll have some that will cleave unto you. They'll recognize what you have. There's some there that were in Athens. They realized the truth. I've been worshiping this stupid idol. And truth hit them. And they converted to truth, to Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And another thing, keep this in mind, it was churches that sent Paul. His home church at Antioch, the church at Philippi, they're the ones ensuring that he can get out and get the message there. They're all a part of this of what's taking place. So again, as we start this conference, I think we see now the importance of having it right, of ensuring we're staying with truth, of allowing our own walk with God to put us in a position where our spirits can be provoked, stirred towards things that are right and not allowing that emotion to be controlled by our flesh. Because listen, being provoked, that's an important emotion that you have. But if carnality, if that controls you, that emotion will be nothing but sensual. It's no longer in the Lord's hand. It's not in God's spirit in your life to control it where you're provoked under things that, that, that will move you into a righteous direction. Your spirit has to be stirred. Maybe it hasn't in a long time, so maybe tonight you need to be praying about that. Maybe you should be praying, tonight, Lord, please stir my heart towards what you'd have me to do this week towards missions. Lord, stir my heart towards my coworkers. The only thing I do is get mad at them. Do you understand that lost people act like lost people? My, my, I'm so tired of my coworkers, they cuss all day. That's because they're lost. That's what they do. Why would you expect a lost person to act like a saved person? Instead, be provoked in the right manner towards them. And that starts with your walk with God. Then you're provoked when you realize they're operating life apart from truth. And as Paul said, notice after Paul dealt with their sin, know what he went to next? What did he go to next in his message? A judgment day is coming. You're going to stand before this creator and he's going to judge you. He's letting them know hell is real. And the answer, of course, was Jesus Christ the one who resurrected from the dead. We want our provoking to be that direction. We want our provoking to be towards, Lord, what would you have me do towards missions and seeking him? With heads bowed and eyes closed. With heads bowed and eyes closed. We want to go into a time of invitation to see if the Lord worked on your heart. And if you did, we certainly want you to respond. If this conference is going to be successful, we have to have our spirits stirred. A lot of things will block that. Sin will block that. You understand that? Sin will block God's Holy Spirit from being able to steer, uh, stir up your spirit. We're going to need that if we're going to take advantage of the opportunities, and then that will allow God to providentially move in our life to give us the, 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 
to the place where we are effective with the gospel. If the Lord works on your heart, I want you to respond. Father in heaven, I do pray that you bless his invitation. Please work in hearts and lives, Lord. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Brother Max. Would you stand? Would you come to the altar tonight? Would you ask God to stir you? Maybe your heart has grown cold. If we're not stirred in the word of God, we'll never be stirred about missions. And I'm going to invite you tonight on the first night as we've heard of just a powerful Bible message. Would you come tonight and say, God, stir me. Stir me. I'm going to ask Miss Sarah to play the theme song, Seven Billion Reasons Why. Come tonight. Reminded of old blind Barnabas in Jericho as the Lord passed by. And he cried out, Lord, don't pass me by. They told him to be quiet and he cried out all the more. Tonight I'm going to challenge you. God, don't pass me by. Stir my heart. Sing that chorus one time. We can put the words up here. Sing with you. Ready? Seven billion reasons why we must spread the gospel to a lost and dying land. Seven billion reasons why Jesus came and offered his life for the sins of man. Souls are dying every day. We must go live and go and pray for the ones he longed to save. The reasons why. Thank you so much. You can be seated. Brother Corbin's going to give us a couple of announcements. Do have a prayer request. LaShondra, 24, has a lip node cancer. If you'll pray for her tonight and uh, put that on your prayer list. And uh, I'm going to ask our missionaries to go ahead and make their way to the foyer and uh, stand by their table. Make sure that you stop by and uh, pick up their prayer cards. Wasn't that a great message tonight? Thank you, Brother Terry. Appreciate that. Man, just, just a powerful, powerful message. Um, and I, I hope that you'll just kind of let that... Work in your heart and be here every night. Brother Corbin, come lead us. Um, well, what a wonderful kickoff to Missions Conference tonight. Um, uh, just want to remind everyone, uh, tomorrow night we're also going to be having a meal before the service, and that was an amazing meal tonight. My wife and I, we just moved down to Tampa, and that was the first time I had had that Cuban meal, and I loved it. So I didn't know my favorite food was Cuban until I moved here, but anyhow. Um, so, but uh, make sure you come out tomorrow night. I believe tomorrow night is Mexican, and uh, so make sure you're in your places. 5.45 will be the start of that meal time, and that will end at 6.45, so make sure you make your way out for that at 7 o'clock service. And uh, then also on Friday night, there will be a, another meal there at the same time, 545, 645. 
And then also put it on your calendar Saturday. Be here. We're going to be having a little send off and go door knocking at 930. And so please come for that meeting. And then we're going to be coming back to the church for a cookout and just a wonderful time of fellowship and uh, looking forward to that. Um, just a couple of things uh, coming up very quickly on the calendar. Uh, ladies, on September 13th, there's going to be an Above Ruby's Ladies Meeting, and the theme is Howdy, Y'all. And uh, this will be out in the Family Life Center. There is sign-up sheets back here on the welcome desk. Um, if you need child care, make sure you go back and sign up for that. And also, there's some sign-up sheets to help with food, so make sure you get on there for that. And then also, for the ladies, it's just all about you tonight. Um, we also have a, a, fam a ladies conference coming up, and uh, that is going to be at Bible Baptist Church in Palm Harbor. And this is going to be Saturday, October 13th from 9 to 3 p.m., uh, the cost is going to be $25 per lady. Uh, the deadline for this registration will be Wednesday, September 26th. And uh, the speakers are going to be Mary Calvert and Sarah Anderson. So make sure that if you're going to that, that you make plans and preparations for that. Well, greet your neighbor with a handshake and a smile. You are dismissed.